Good morning and welcome to the latest episode of the 1904 Club, the Hull City podcast from the Hull Daily Mail. And this morning I'm joined by Burnsy. Burnsy, how are you? Uh, morning, still frustrated. My uh, default position for the season, frustrated. So that's me this morning. I thought you meant in life. I'm going to try general. and be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, well, there is that as well. I'm going to try and be optimistic. Try being the operative word. We'll give it a go. And uh, we've got a special guest this morning coming all the way from Germany, Catherine Batty. The, uh, Catherine, um, you cover West Ham for the, the Mail, don't you? I do indeed, yes. But but lifelong Hull City fan, decked out in Hull City colours out there in Lever Leverkusen. How are things over there? Yeah, not too bad, actually. When I was out on a run this morning wearing this uh, shirt, I got a bit of a strange look from a man in a Leverkusen hat. So um, I quite enjoy doing that sometimes when I go to kind of matches abroad, sort of wearing a whole shirt and about um, just to see kind of what looks I get. And uh, yeah, I don't think the man that I went, ran past was too impressed for some reason. <laughs> um, you caught the game last night. What was what was your overriding feeling of um, of, of the 2-2 draw against Middlesbrough? It felt like the story of the season, really. I thought we played really well in, in some parts. I thought we were quite dominant for, for a lot of the game. And and again, it was just the problem of scoring goals. Obviously, we got a little bit of luck in the, in the goals we scored in the first half. Um, second half, I, I thought we played some really good football, but just couldn't kind of find that clinical touch, which has been missing in, in too many games this season. And I think that was kind of a great illustration of why we're not in the playoffs and why we're not going to probably get in the playoffs that game last night kind of summed up just how the season's gone really I think you're spot on it kind of Burnsy didn't it it kind of everything I said this to Liam Rossini after the game that everything we've seen at home this season was kind of rolled into for the most part rolled into that 90 minutes there's some brilliant football some exciting moments a couple of good goals but some you know really naive mistakes that, that cost them and cost them the goals and they've ended up drawing another game at home at their eighth draw at home out of 21 only seven wins, that tells its own story, doesn't it? Indeed. Um, and uh, just, we've lost Catherine there. Oh, no, okay. she's back. Um, yeah, Liam Rossini's first words last night, I think, in, in a couple of interviews were the same story. And, mm. and, and, that, and that sums it up. I didn't, I didn't know last... I'm, I'm, st I'm still not certain in my own mind. I felt at half-time, given the way they'd finished the, the first half, that they needed to keep the foot on the gas in the second half. And they didn't, for me. They 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 sort of sat back in the initial period of it and, and didn't take the game to, to Middlesbrough. But ironically, when they did take the game to Middlesbrough, that's where the Middlesbrough equaliser came from because Morton didn't get the shot off. He elected to try and beat another, go sideways and try and beat a man rather than getting the shot off. So I'm, I'm a bit sort of conflicted about it as to whether that tactically it was right in the second half or not. I think the majority of us watching would have liked to have seen them keep the the, the foot on Middlesbrough's throat at the start of the second half, but I think they did set, um, sit back. Um, so it, it, it is the same story. And, and that what frustrates me most, and it'll, because they've not sorted it out. And I, I'm not quite sure why they've sorted it, not sorted it out, because it's 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 been same old, same old. And that's the frustration of it. And Catherine, that is the frustration, isn't it? Because there's so much, there's so much to like about this this team. The the, the group of players are a good group. You know where you think if you think of where City have come from over the last, even even from this time last year, to be in the top ten and, and challenging for pl the playoffs, and having been in the top six for so long this season, you know it is so frustrating that they are so close, aren't they? Yeah, and I think um, that's probably what's frustrating Liam Rossini as well because he's watching his players kind of do the same thing each week and um, I think what we're missing is obviously you know, that number nine that, you know, we, we had it in Liam de Lapp a little bit. Um, losing him was probably was probably key, I think. I think if we'd kept him fit, we maybe would have scored some of the goals that we were lacking in, in the games that we dropped points in. Um, and he's probably now going to come back when it's probably too late. And I just wonder whether whether we should have kind of gambled on hoping he would come back and, and make that difference at the end of the season or sending him back to Manchester City and trying to bring a another striker in. Um, I know we brought Ohio in, but it, it's probably it's not quite clicked for him yet. Um, so that's kind of been the thing we've missing. We've kind of got too many number 10s and not 
and, and not a good enough number nine, I don't think. Go on, Benji. I agree on the. I, I agree on the the too many number tens. Definitely too uh, many number tens. But I, I, I hate to come back to it because I tend to bang on about it. But they brought in a number nine in Billy Sharp, but it's it's not worked out. He got a few minutes uh, last night, and uh, this uh, I've I've got a tweet which will come to at some point from somebody about the the recruitment. I think the recruitment's been a a, a factor. Uh, the the tweet's quite damning about the recruitment in terms of players that have come in. Dilap was off a, a, a big um, big mix, big miss. But um, yeah, not adequate. Nowhere near adequately replaced. And then the, the injury to Connolly has, has not helped the situation uh, either. And he looks a shadow of the player he was earlier in the season. So it's just I keep coming back to frustrating at the risk of repeating myself. That's how I feel this morning. Though I was trying to be a bit more optimistic this morning. You know, dawn of a new day, a bit of optimism. Um, but is it a false dawn? Because you look at the table, and you still think. If if they were if they were coming into form and they'd, they'd reach the position they're in, you'd think they've got a chance here. That they're, they're in a bit of form. But you look at the championship table and you think, yeah, mathematically there's still a chance. And you know Norwich have got to go away again on Saturday, and they're not great away from home, and they've got to play Coventry. And um, then you look at the form table, and they're about 17th or 18th in the form table, and 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 the reality. So set sets in, and and I think I mean all you if, if you're clutching at straws now, you, you're clutching at Delap, who won't start on Saturday, so he'll only be on the bench, and you're clutching at the the dog eat dog uh, nature of the championship. That folks is me trying to be optimistic <laughs> and failing miserably. They are, in fairness, Catherine. They, you know, when you look at the table, the, the form table in the last six games, one winning six, they're seventeenth. Norwich are top, Coventry a third. Uh, Mathematically, there's a chance, but how do you uh, how do you view it? Yeah, I, I think. Oh, sorry, Catherine. I was going. I was going to say. I think this is the problem for me. I keep getting my hopes up, and then I keep they keep being crushed up again. So I've just kind of tried to tell myself that the season's kind of done, and then we keep giving ourselves a little bit of a glimmer of hope. And the thing with Norwich is, I think. I know they obviously they let a two goal slip, um, two goal lead slip against Sheffield Wednesday, but I can't see them dropping more points just because of the way they're playing. They've got um, goal scorers that we don't have. You know, like you look at Josh Sargent, who is you know kind of regularly scoring for them, um, and you know they didn't lose the uh, you know midweek. They only they only drew, and Sheffield Wednesday are fighting for their lives as well. So I just kind of can't see Norwich slipping out of out of six but I suppose as you say while there's still a chance they've got to still kind of see it as that and actually they play it better when the pressure's off so we'll probably go and win on the weekend and then give ourselves another glimmer of hope again the one that backs really... is kicking if they don't win at the weekend yeah we'll come on to that in a minute I wanted to raise this actually it's really interesting because the, the disposition of both managers when they came in to speak to the media last night Michael Carrick was first in as is the the theme the way manager generally comes in first um and um, he, he was bouncing. And the, the, the first question from my colleague Craig to to, um, to Michael was, that point's no good, is it really? You, you know, how do you see it? And he was like, you're joking, aren't you? You know, there's still a chance. We've got four games to go. You know, it's six points, but anything can happen. Liam received. So he was basically saying, you know, we've got every chance. If, if we take care of our results, things will happen. Very, very, very positive. Liam on the flip side. And, and sometimes Liam... After games, is particularly emotional. If I, if I'm, I would imagine when I see him tomorrow before the QPR game, his his, his demeanour might be a little bit different. But after the game last night, he was very much two points gone. We need. He said we need snookers. You know, we're now relying on other people to help us out. Uh, we're not winning enough games, and and that's if anything, City. When you look at the table, are in are in a better position in the sense that they're on the same points that City still have that game in hand. So if Middlesbrough think they've got a chance. Then Hull City must still have a chance. Burnsy, are you what bracket are you falling into? I do see that, and uh, I, uh, like I said earlier, if if you were on with coming with a bit of momentum and therefore unbeaten in eight Middlesbrough, you'd be optimistic. You think we might time this right? We're we're, we're the horse yeah. coming from about six furlongs back with about three furlongs to go or two furlongs to go. I don't know where I'm going with this horse racing analogy, but... You You're know, trying to shoot in the Grand National, aren't you, basically? 
yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're time in their run. So they're, they're feeling good about the situation, whereas we come back to City and it's the same story and they keep throwing away opportunity. And uh, they keep throwing away opportunity and they keep throwing away opportunity. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can understand the, the Carrick point of view because they found the form at the right time or seem to have found their form at the right time. And, and they've got that little push. Andy Vickers says to the 1904 club, um, it was another classic seven out of ten performance. You need wins by any means. We just aren't ruthless enough, which is, I think, a fair summation of uh, where they're at. The Lemon Kid says, let's make that 16 home wins in 55. This um, he, he said at half time he'd really enjoyed the first half, but um, it's shocking, it's embarrassing, and it's just simply not good enough. I think that's since Ajahn took over the club. Um, and what, did, what else have we got? Um, John Smith says, I've now run out of patience with all sop. Cost us too many points this season. Great with his feet, but so poor when it comes to agility. For me, they have to go after Johansson at Rotherham. He's a decent keeper, but he's been busy. He's had lots of practice this season. We'll maybe talk about all sop uh, slightly later. Baz? Yeah, Catherine, I, I want, on the home form, what, 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 can you, what can you tell us about the home form? Because... It feels like to me, having covered City now for four years, that the home that, and we take okay, the COVID season was a was obviously one off, and I didn't get to see that because I was locked in, I wasn't allowed in the ground, so I had to watch that on the telly. Um, but in the three seasons since, it's um, it's been a problem. Even under Shotter, it was a problem. Obviously, Andy Dawson came in, and then Liam came in after that, and, it, and it's 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 not resolved itself. But I think back, you know, to earlier in my. Uh, career when I was covering Nottingham Forest and I was coming to the MKM Stadium or KC as a KCOM as it was then and there was a there was a City weren't great at home then so it, is it a problem that, and Burns you can probably tap in after Catherine as well and is this a problem that's been ongoing for a period of years and not just you know not just under Liam? Um, I think the home form was a problem for a while under the previous ownership, partly because the ground wasn't very full and we couldn't really yeah. generate the atmospheres like we had done in years gone by. Uh, you know, you think when Phil Brown and Peter Taylor were there because the ground was always full under them and under Steve Bruce. But then, you know, when we had that period of where a, a lot of fans kind of were staying away or, had, you know, had been priced out and things like that, um, it's very difficult to generate any kind of atmosphere and that probably fed in slightly to the players, but also I think partly because at times the squad just wasn't good enough. I think under Liam, it's almost like it, you can't use that excuse because the, the stadium's been been full and you've had great crowds and great atmospheres. I think it's almost a different sort of problem and maybe a coincidence that it's affecting the team at home that we just kind of seem to play better. Our style of football maybe suits playing away from home a little bit more. And mm. maybe teams come to the to um, to the MKM and sit sit try and defend, which doesn't kind of suit our style of football because we're we find it difficult sometimes to break down you know low box or or, or teams that are um, set up to frustrate us. Whereas away from home, when the home teams kind of got to try and take the game to the opposition a little bit, that's where we can find the gaps and where maybe. It suits us a little bit more. That's maybe kind of my take partly on it, um, part of one of the reasons that we've maybe struggled at home. And maybe, I don't know whether pressure plays into it a little bit, almost like you would think the atmosphere would help the players. Sometimes I wonder kind of having that full crowd at home, whether actually that it adds more pressure to the players. They've got to be able to cope with that, but I wonder if that's part of it as well. Okay, go on, Bernsey. Yeah, I'm just picking up on Catherine's last point there. I did a, a, an event for the Senior Tigers recently and that's a question came up and and somebody suggested somebody who's uh, connected to to one of the players that they struggled a little bit with the pressure of of playing at home and going back to previous seasons it was interesting in the season they got promoted under Grant McCann there were no fans in the ground yeah. and yeah, I'm yeah. still of the belief that the fans that have been in the ground they might have struggled to get promoted that season having been relegated so I, I, I think that's a factor whether that's an excuse or not, it, you know, you're getting paid to play professional football. If you've got aspirations of playing at the top level, you have you have to cope with that pressure, would, would be my view. Um, you, you've, you, I don't think the pan, fans put them under tremendous pressure, but I'm, I'm told the players look at social media and things like that. 
I'd be banning it if I was the manager. Get you know, say don't go on social media because you might get some stick from time to time. But you've got to me, you've got to be able to cope with that pressure. Otherwise, you're in the wrong job. Um, so I, I, I think that they've, they've, they've got to get on with it. And um, yeah, the, I, I don't know on the home form. It's it's because Middlesbrough came to play last night. They surprised me to some extent. I don't know what you two feel, but they actually came because they'd scored early. They set up aggressively and they thought we'll we'll have a go at this. I thought they might come cagey because other teams have done so and frustrated City and they've run out of ideas and not scored and then hit them on the counter punch later. So they actually opened up and I think Liam Rossini said after the game to, to, to Mike White that, you know, that suited them that they, they opened up. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all a mystery at times. It's all a mystery. Catherine, the thing is, I, th I guess the frustration from City fans is there have been so many, as we touched on at the start, there have been so many games like last night that have promised so much and have delivered not enough. And that is ultimately, as you said yourself, it looks realistically now like they are going to miss out on the playoffs. Games are running out and they're not winning games at home. Uh, and But they've had so many, you know, Liam said it himself, so many drop points. Middlesbrough's just won. You know, Plymouth, if you go back earlier in the season, um, the Birmingham game recently, you know, they were brilliant for 85 minutes, won the up, but only only won the up. If they'd got the second goal, they'd have won the game comfortably and it's a different conversation. And last night was a, another example, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And I think um, you touch on Birmingham and Plymouth there. They're the games that, have, that will end up costing us. And I think I've got a friend that's a Birmingham fan. A few weeks ago, they were saying that was the only the point they'd picked up in a really, really long run of games. I think they might have picked up one since in the last couple of matches. But that kind of tells you everything, that Birmingham had gone so long without picking up any points, but they managed to nick one off us that night. And we're almost we're too generous to, to teams at other teams at times, I feel. Um, you, there's so many kind of home games. You look, we, I remember we, we beat Southampton away, brilliant away win. Yeah. Instead of kind of building on it, but then we got West Brom at home next. OK, it's a, it's a tricky game, you know, West Brom are in the playoffs and you look at it and you get a point and you think, all right, that, that might be a good point in the long run. But, but the way we, you know, we went uh, we went ahead in that game. Um, we just We just can't really sometimes hold on to leads and we don't punish teams when we're on top of them. It's like... That's I think that's the, the big problem is that we don't kind of take yeah punish teams when we're on top I think. But see, that's the killer, isn't okay. it? It is. Yeah, it, it is points dropped as Catherine says. It's two, it's two points again. Last night, having been in front, you think of the Birmingham game. Birmingham game, two points, having been in front. Um, you know, West Brom. Catherine's you go in front. Yes, it's West Brom. Difficult game, but they go in front. Don't get the second goal and get punished. You know, that's three games I've just reeled off there where they've dropped two points in each game. Six points have dropped from winning positions in the last month or so. Um the, the Not game even there, mentioned Stoke. And e even when you go back, even when you go back to late September against Leeds, yes, Leeds had in that first half, Leeds had some bad some big chances and and, and to their credit, City stuck in the game. And they, they they played their way into the game and it was nip and tuck. And then Troy gets the 185 minutes and, and it's and it's the post. You know, again, that's that, that was nil-nil, and it finishes nil-nil, but Traore, open goal, hits the post. They probably go on and win that game. That's three points. That's two more points there. And it is that, that has been their, their their problem. That is something that over the summer they're going to have to sit down and, and reflect on and find a way. What I do find interesting, actually, Norwich are almost a carbon copy, but away from home. So, you know, that's the reason these teams are, are in mid-table or... The, you know, just in the top six because they're not con they're not consistent at home and away like a Leeds, Ipswich, and Leicester. I guess Burnsy, go on. I was just mentioning Traore there. He was he was on the bench tonight. He's become the forgotten man. But to to, to me, that's a symbol of um, of the recruitment. Of the, and Catherine was saying lots of number tens. He's a number ten. He's you know not been effective. Um, he, You've got to look at the recruitment. Can we can we talk about Allsop? Because for the first time last night, uh, we've been sort of steadfastly, stead, largely steadfastly defending him on the um, on the nineteen oh four club. But I sort of reached the point last night where I thought you shouldn't have been beaten on that first goal. So you shouldn't have been beaten by that at your near post. And Nigel tweeted us to say, did did you spot the fact that? Um, Greaves was having a go at him straight after the goal. And I did spot that. And I thought, yeah. oh, that's quite telling there. And, you know, I, 
he got beat its near post at Cardiff on Saturday. And I'm starting to come to people's opinions that say he gets beat too often, too low. Um, he does all the things that Liam wants with his feet, but ultimately, goalkeeper, very old fashioned, I know. It's what you do with your hands. And um, I think there's a question mark over him. Uh, I'm not necess- I'm not saying throw Pandor in because I think that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but they brought him in. I think there's a decision to be made in the summer, personally. What do you think? Three, three clean sheets in 21 for City. Um, again, that tells its own story. And You, you know, uh, Liam, I, I asked Liam last night about the, the, the first goal. Um, he, he didn't really want to. I, I understand it. He wants to protect his players. He's not going to come out and go, yeah, goalkeeper was rubbish, should have saved it, you know, blah, blah. Uh, Catherine, what's your what's your take on, on the goalkeeper situation and Ryan also? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel bad. I don't want to kind of, you know, hammer ham all sort, but I've kind of felt it for quite a while in the season. I just I just don't think he's good enough in terms of being at, at that level if you want to be in the playoffs or in the top two. Um, I actually don't think he's as good with his feet, maybe as Liam Rossini makes out. I think when I've um, when I've watched City this season, I've always kind of been a bit fearful when the, when the ball goes back to him because he he seems to kind of take too long sometimes to decide if he's going to pass it there. And he's a bit slow. I don't think his long kicking is particularly fantastic either. Um, he has made some brilliant saves at times in games that have kind of kept that have won points. I remember Middlesbrough away he made that fantastic save right at the end. So there have been times where he has actually kept his in games and you obviously have to remember that as well. But I look at Carl Darlow on, on the bench for Leeds, who obviously was fantastic in the second half of last season. Um, I know he's made a couple of mistakes when he has played for Leeds this year, but that's probably because he's not had a run of games. And I almost just think it's a bit of a waste. He's kind of been sat on their bench. I think he's better with his feet from what I saw of him last season. And I think better with his hands as well. And I think if we'd had him in goal instead of Allsop, maybe, I'm not saying it's the difference between getting in the playoffs and not getting in the playoffs, but I think it would have made a big difference for us um, if we'd managed to get him instead. And I do wonder whether you can persist with Allsop next season. Obviously, we don't really know anything about Pandor and how kind of good he is. Um, so it's a bit of an unknown quantity in that respect. But obviously, we know kind of Matt Ingram's probably, I assume, might be on his way at some point. Um and we've kind of seen in the past that you, been you, enough with his feet. If you were Matt Ingram, you'd be on your way, wouldn't you? You'd, yeah. you'd think, well, I'm a goalkeeper, I, I want to play. And you you make a fine point about Darlow. That was a great disappointment because he was the, the number one target. John Smith says to us, uh, Ree Alsop, I can point out so many instances uh, where he's been beaten at his near and far post. He does not get down quick enough. He was also lucky in the second half when he spilled the shot right into their player, but they couldn't control it. We're not... I'm not trying to pick on him, uh, but it is a factor of the performance. At the other end, they're not scoring enough goals as well. Um, and that's, it's, that's, it's that's becoming that, in, in, that's sorry, the key. That's, that, that's the key, isn't it? The, the fact that the, these, you know, yes, I mean, in real time last night, I, I couldn't believe that it, it, that Latty Lafford on on that subject. By the way, he's in great form um, and. I thought his performance last night, particularly in the first half, um, was was everything the city haven't got in, in a player that can lead the line and 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 and, and running behind and stretch the game. But yeah, it, and I've seen I've seen two or three replays since uh, that happened last night, and everyone gets worse. And it is it, it, you know his positioning is wrong. His all, his positioning is all wrong. Um, the fact to go straight for his legs, it, it, yeah. And it's it's a big error. They re, they, re, but what I would say is that as a, as a collective, they responded really well, and they went two one up, and he got away with one second half when it from House, and he he he, he nervous. I, I thought he looked nervous all night, if I'm honest, and that and that probably is is a reflection of the of the first goal. It was probably still playing on his mind, you know, and it, it seemed to affect his confidence throughout. There was the House and shot second half that he spilled into, and it hit Latty Lath, and luckily it went kind of that side of the post rather than this side of the post. Um, but but yeah, there have been. I think back to Swansea away. There was you know a, a couple of moments. He does seem to get down low, uh, struggle to get down low quick enough. Um, but Catherine's point about Darlow is fantastic because he was their number one target. They wanted Darlow. Uh, they tried everything to get Darlow in the summer for what, for a number of reasons. They could not get it. And it is for me. It's a real shame for for, for Carl because you know he he spent 
however many years at Newcastle, being second choice, third choice, sometimes whatever, rarely playing. He came to Hull City last January, played. You know, he had to bide his time. He had to wait a couple of weeks to get it, to get his game. Um, I remember the first. I think the first game that after Darla had signed, Matt Ingram saved a penalty. I think it was against Cardiff. He eventually got his chance and, and took it. And then he's gone to Leeds and has basically become second fiddle to Elan Melier. And what I, I, I questioned, I kind of understood Darla going to Leeds in, in some respects, but other ways I questioned his motives for going to Leeds because it was very obvious he was going to be second choice again. So from his career point of view, Catherine, has that been a, that does seem to have been a, I don't want to say a poor move because players make moves for various reasons, don't they? But it does seem a strange one and one that City, you know, have, have, have lost on, if you like. Yeah, I think the only thing maybe Dallow thought he could challenge Melier for that number one spot, I think he kind of lost his place at the end of the season in the Premier League, didn't he? I think potentially... Yeah. Um, Allardyce had replaced him. Um, so maybe he kind of saw that as quite an open fight. I can go in there and be the number one for Leeds and maybe they've got a better chance of promotion. Obviously, just hasn't kind of worked out that way. Um, whether whether he's, whether he ends up being open to a move in the summer, I don't know whether they'd go back for him, whether they whether he's somebody they could afford. Um, I assume he signed a reasonable long contract with Leeds and maybe he, again, maybe he think, thinks if he can get in the Premier League with them, he can um, he can challenge for that number one spot again, but I think it'd be quite difficult for him. You, Bertie, just, you mentioned uh, Robert, didn't you? Yeah, I, well, it, it was. Uh, I think it was John um, who got in touch on uh, Twitter with the nineteen oh four club mentioned it, and from what I've seen, I've not seen loads of him, um, and he'll have been a busy lad this season at Rotherham. He, he looks a, a he looks an impressive goalkeeper, but I mean they paid the money for Pandor, so at some point he's got to got to get a chance. My question to the pair of you would be, this Saturday, would you make the change? Catherine, go on then. You can answer, you can have that one first. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I, I kind of feel like, why not at this point? But that feels a bit reckless. Um, I feel like maybe to, to front, kind of throw somebody in, a new keeper in who's not played with the defence, and then if he has an absolute shocker or something, you're then kind of going, OK, maybe that wasn't a very good idea. But at this point, it sort of feels like, well, Olsop's not, not playing very well at all. Um, you know, maybe you want to give Panda a chance and throw him into a, a difficult game, see how he responds. He could have a, he could have an absolute blinder, but um, I think yeah. I, part of me thinks, oh yeah, go on, why not? But then yeah, that's probably why I'm uh, not a football manager. Yeah, I would say not this weekend. Um, it's always a big decision, isn't it, to change a goalkeeper? I think Liam um, sees it as he's one of the he's a modern manager, isn't he? I think he sees it more of like the Mikel Arteta thing, where I've got two goalkeepers, Vogel goalkeepers, I can interchange them, although. That's what Arteta said when he signed Raya, and it's not really worked out like that. In fairness, for Aaron Ramsdale, but I, I, I'm I'm uneasy about it at, at this stage. Um, I, I do think that Panda will get a chance before the end of the season. We saw it last season on the final day. Uh, Darlow didn't play. Matt Ingram played because um, obviously for for whatever reason. Um, I do obviously. I've, I've only seen him. Play, I've only seen him play once. I saw him play against Curacao out in Turkey. First. Five ten minutes, he was nervous, made a couple of rash uh, rash decisions, which is going to, you know, I, you you understand, you expect that. It, it was his first game; he would, he'd have been desperate to impress. Whether you throw him in um, to a championship game that City simply have to win um, is a big call, and that is, I wouldn't rule it out. I, I, I genuinely wouldn't rule it out. He was asked last night about it, and. Um, he didn't rule it out. He said, "I wouldn't be afraid to make that decision if I need, if I felt it was the right one for the team." Uh, my gut feeling, as I sit here now, I think Allsop stays in net um, at least for QPR. I'm uh, probably, I, I, perhaps, I could see him coming out um, on the final day at Plymouth if there's nothing riding on the game. But I, I think I, I kind of get the feeling that Liam would be reluctant to make that change when there's that there is still a chance. Admittedly. I saw. I said we said on the on Monday show, didn't we, that that Sky put up an Opta stat um, after the Norwich game against Ipswich and before we played at Cardiff that, that, that City got a two percent chance of making the playoffs. I can't imagine that's improved much beyond uh, beyond that after last night. But I think while there is still a chance, 
think the manager would be reluctant to make a change. Go on, Benzie, are you going to say something? Uh, no, I, I, um, I, I can see that. I, I, I see absolutely where, where your thinking is. Part of me, as we were having this conversation, thought, well, what, what about Ingram? I know he's sort of totally out of favour, but I, I like him as a goalkeeper. He's, yeah, I, I, this, is not, this, this is not being disrespectful. No. He's, 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 he's more than a steady Eddie, and his shot stopping, I think, is better than all socks. Um, and he, he would be less of a risk. There's less unknown quantity about him than Pandor, uh, I would have to say. But the fact that he's not even making the, the bench suggests to me that his time at City is over. Uh, Nick says, uh, you know, just following up, seriously, can we have a big chat on the podcast about Olsop? He's good with his feet, but he cannot get down quick enough to low shots and his positioning at the near post is horrifying. Second game in a row he's conceded from his near post. And CJ, just on the, well, actually, should we round up the um, the, the the goalkeeper discussion before we we move on on the 1904 club. Anything either of you want to add? Am I, am I losing my mind saying steady Eddie Ingram, Catherine? Uh, I've still not forgiven Olsop for getting lobbed against Watford. I got reminded of that by a Watford fan last night who's who's out here if covering the West Ham, West Ham game. And I just thought, oh God, yeah, that was another kind of shocker. We've still got to play Watford away, of course, as well. Yeah, and the issue for me, they, they got... There have been goals this season where Orsop hasn't covered himself in glory. I, I, I like Orsop, I think, um, you know, but the, the, I can't deny there have been mo moments in games that have cost, uh, the, you know, it, situation Swansea, the Watford, the Watford, yeah, it's a free goal, uh, Last, but last night I, was poor. But three clean sheets in 21, you know, for and that is, you know, Liam was Liam was always classed as it sounds daft to say because this is his first proper job as in first full time managerial job, but he he kind of got a reputation for when he arrived for being a really kind of defensively minded coach necessarily but quite pragmatic really solid obviously we know when he when he the, the team he inherited was like a colander and he tightened it up overnight and, and made them really difficult to beat almost at the expense of of the other end well he he said last summer that he wanted to try and kind of flip that dial a bit and, and make that make his team more expansive and create more. And that, unfortunately, that's, that has been at the risk of, of of being fairly open going the other way. I mean, it's mad to think that three clean sheets in 21, but yet we're talking about Jacob Greaves being player of the season. For me, he gets all my votes. I, I think Alfred Jones has had a very good season. Louis Cole's had a very good season. They've obviously had if, issues at left back. You know, Vinagra came in to big fanfare. That didn't work. Matty Jacobs has been in and out. They've been playing... Greavesy, they've been playing coyly there. Giles has come in and, and done okay, but was awful. I thought I, I thought he was poor at Leeds. Uh, didn't cover himself in glory last night. So left back's been an ongoing issue all season. But three clean sheets in twenty one is making their life so so difficult because they're having to score two again to to win. Or and it, that is that is a fundamental problem, isn't it, Catherine? Yeah, I think. I mean, Jacob Greaves, I agree. I think you lose him for two games and you lose both the games. I think that kind of summed it up for me, just how yeah, important absolutely. it is. Um, and I think it's a lack of depth. I think if you lose... I remember we lost Alfie Jones. Uh, or he wasn't available to play QPR away and we were awful that day as well. And I think as soon as you lose one of those two, it unsettles the defence massively. And that's where you've not got the depth of somebody to come in. I know, I know Sean McLaughlin is, is you know, very much a competent defender, but I think the issue for him is kind of not playing for so long and then coming into a game it's very difficult then to kind of he's not built a proper relationship with either centre half I think he's better alongside Jones because he's left footed and Jones is right footed um, whereas obviously Greaves is left footed um, I also think maybe the defence isn't protected particularly well enough um, you've not I still think for for a long time we've lacked a, a midfielder that's really kind of going to break up the play and put a tackle in and I look at kind of Sari Morton Slater. Um, Slater's more of a box to box man, um, not really kind of like a someone that's going to break up play. I don't think, uh, and he's kind of had to fill in different positions. Sari and Morton very much kind of ball playing midfielders. So you could argue it sometimes. Maybe the um, you know maybe the defence isn't getting the protection they need as well, and sometimes the full backs aren't helped by the wingers as well. Um, mm. But yeah, silly mistakes. Too often, I think. Bernsey, QPR yeah, then. Let's, let's, 
quickly throw ahead then QPR Saturday. Um, they're quite given the fact that they are where they are on the table. Uh, it's that their their home form has been um, for me to tell here. Their, their home form has been pretty shoddy all season. It's their their away form. I think they've won seven on the road away from Loftus Road. So um, you know it, it's, a, it's a game for them that's got huge jeopardy. Jeopardy. They're they're in the thick of the relegation battle. Although the, the couple of results had started to pull them away. Um, how do you see it? Well, they seem to have picked up. I've not done a great study of their form, in in all honesty. But it's it, it's another um, game. City have have got to win. Their new manager seems to be getting a tune out of them. And uh, I think back to the transfer window and and QPR and Tan Kessler going to see um, is it Chris Willock at QPR? Was, yeah. yeah, yeah. He he would have been a good addition if the. The, you know, because he scores goals, and if, if they could have got him out, but you know, we're, we're, the phones are going off in the crying over spilt milk department there. So um, they've got to win it. They've got to perform it. Just be. I, I know you're wrapping it up, Baz. I just wanted Bobby Joyce sent us a, um, or actually sent me a question for the 1904 club. We don't necessarily have to do it today because of time, but um, it might be one for Monday. Half, um, half the squad will be gone in the summer, and when you analyse it. Almost all of the best consistent performers this season were already at the club when Liam Rossini became manager. His signings have generally not worked. Can he be trusted with a rebuild? And then he analyses uh, most of the signings um, that have come in. Um, we might save that for for, yeah, for another sure. day. Yeah, I think that I think that warrants a, a, it's a, it's a. It's an interesting question. I'm not sure I agree with it. Um, personally, I, I, I take the point about the, the consistent performers already at the club: Louis, Alfie, uh, Jacob, Regan. But I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with that. But we'll, we'll cover that another time. One thing I did want to I'll point out: it. yeah, save that. Put mark, mark that for another, bookmark it for another another time. Because um, because I because I can see the merit in some of his argument when he when he lists the players, and you know yeah. I've got to be in my bonnet about the recruitment, which I I, I, I think has had flaws in it. What, what before we wrap up? What I did want to touch on from last night was, that, you know, it, it was actually a really, really entertaining game of football, a really enjoyable game. Okay, we didn't get the result that we wanted. We <clears throat> we all desperately wanted three points and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a as a game of football, it was actually I like the fact that it was two teams having a go, scored a couple of good goals, decent atmosphere, played on a decent pitch. Really liked Abdush again. I thought Abdush was was excellent. There was a moment in I think it was in the first, sorry, in the second half. He, he he was down on the touchline by the by halfway, and he, he had his shirt almost ripped off his back. Unbelievably, Gavin Ward, the referee, stood there, looked to blow, didn't blow. Was looking at his assistant, who didn't, who was there as well, didn't give it. The play carried on. Middlesbrough attacked, got him down the left hand side, and Abdush, bless him, ran all the way back, won the ball, and came away. And I, I kind of felt that typified his performance. Obviously, he had, he had the shot in the first half that Ailing headed off the line. He had the one second half. From two fan, he probably should have scored. I think if that if that's Carvalho, I would say that's in the back of the net. Um, but uh, you know, Catherine, what have you made of Abdush? Because he, I feel like he's he's come in and he's he's hit the ground running. And, and what, whatever happens in the next four or five games, he's going to be a key asset next season. Yeah, I've really liked him. Uh, as you say, like last night, he had the chance. We probably just needed to lift it over the goalkeeper. But his, his overall kind of play has been really good. Um, you think about the Huddersfield game away from home where he's come on, he's put that cross in for the Greaves winner. Um, yeah. It really kind of lively, trying to make stuff happen. Um, and yeah, I think next season he, he'd definitely kind of be somebody kind of look to maybe try and build the team around if you're not going to have, obviously, you know, a Carvalho whatever happens with Philogene and, and potentially others that may or may not be here. Um, he's certainly a player that can create things and can kind of get us up up at the pitch and seems like a good character to have around as well. You talk about his work rate. So um, he's definitely been um, impressive. And Birdsey, him and Tufan have struck up a really nice a really nice relationship off the pitch. I did I did an interview with, with Abdush last week uh, and he spoke glowingly about, about the club in general, about the area, about the people at the club. Um, and 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 I'm two fan as well, obviously. But on the pitch, them two seem to have struck up a really nice kind of um, link, don't they? Yeah, it's it's on the pitch that matters. I, I, I still get frustrated. I've overused the word frustrated on this edition of the 1904 club. I still get frustrated by two fan. I still feel there should have been more from him because uh, the the talents there. But Ab, Abdush is a, a is a joy to watch. 
Um, I like watching him. There, there's something there. There's definitely a player there. And next season, he'll be uh, a big asset. And uh, Catherine's point about Carvalho going back, I think Abdush could fill that role. Um, you know, they're both number 10s to, number tens for me, but that's maybe one for the future. I just want to read out a, a, a couple of tweets because people are good enough to send us tweets. Uh, Jason Statham says, and they're both sort of relatively optimistic, the uh, Jason I've enjoyed Statham. this season. <laughs> Not the Jason Statham. Otherwise, that you'd see a car crashing through my um, my <laughs> bifold doors here, and you know the helicopter would be coming down the back of your house, and Catherine in labour queues in there. Suddenly, the SAS would be through the window. It's not that Jason Statham. Okay. But stay tuned. This might be the most exciting moment ever in the 1904 club if any of that happens. Um, so Jason Statham says, I've enjoyed this season. Uh, the development under Rosie has been brilliant. I would take issue with the word brilliant, personally. I think it's well short of brilliant. Uh, you can see, clearly see it's a work in progress. I'd take that. Uh, so we would just miss out on a playoff spot where the teams above have been setting records all season long. To me, it's a successful season. Consistency will come. Well, hopefully it, it needs to. And uh, this from... Uh, to the 1904 club, uh, coming in from Caroline Diamond, who says, we're lacking a latty laugh, but with Dilat back, anything could happen. See, it's the hope, as you said earlier, Catherine, gets you every time. Yeah, I think, look, we, we, everybody wants to play. Catherine, I, I don't know what you think on this, but I, everybody wants the playoffs. We all want to get in there and we all want to, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of, a lot of investment, a lot of promise, and ultimately it looks like they are going to fall short. But I still think, and and this is we'll talk about this a lot, you know, when we do the 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 elongated post mortem in a, in a couple of weeks. But I still think it's been a really enjoyable season. There have been moments of frustration and moments where you can wait, you know, banging your head against a brick wall. But you know, in a forty six game season, that is going to happen. And I think the progress has been really good from where they from where they've been the last couple of years since since promotion from. From League One, that the the way the squad has developed, the way the style has developed, it's been really enjoyable to watch. And there's been some some terrific games this season. And and, and you know we're coming into the final five games of the season, and they're still in with a chance of the playoffs. That is, yes, it should be better. It could be better. And with 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 this and that at home, particularly at home, it, it with this, you know the, the conversation might be a little bit different. But on the whole, I think it's been a really enjoyable season. And I don't think we should all. I don't, I don't think it needs root and branch change and people sacking here and players being bombed off here, there and everywhere. It, you know, it's been a good season and I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the football club is is making massive strides on and off the pitch um, and is going in the right direction. As, as a fan, Catherine, you know, how do you, just to sum it up, how do you reflect on it all? Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, we were kind of sat here saying all we wanted was a team that kind of could compete and to kind of feel like you were enjoying going to watch games again and being a fan again. Because we had so many years where it just kind of felt like that the excitement and the passion had kind of been drained from us a little bit. And we've got that back now. And yeah, OK, we might miss out on the playoffs. But I think if you'd have said to us at the start of the season, you know, you have however many games left and there's still be a chance of getting in. I think most people would have taken that because I think a lot of outsiders, I was always quite optimistic going into this season, but I think a lot of outsiders probably would have had us as mid-table, kind mm. of maybe, you know, maybe just outside the playoffs. Um, so I think it's been good to think when where from Liam's come from to where we are now. There's a clear style of play. Definitely need improvements. We need we need us, you know, to say like we need a striker and a number nine, the most difficult position to find. Yeah. Uh, I'm and I think, well. <laughs> yeah, and I think you have to remember that you know the three teams that come down from the Premier League every year have still got that advantage of the parachute payments. And you look at Leicester's squad, you look at Southampton and Leeds. It's it's still very difficult to compete, you know. And other clubs have spent money as well. I think people kind of forget that Ipswich haven't just kind of come up from League One and just not spent any money. They've, they've they have invested as well. Um, so there's, the competition in the Championship is always going to be fierce. Um, and as I say, yeah, it's, it's it's been great to kind of see us have a go. And hopefully, if we do miss out this season, which looks likely, hopefully next season we can take it up a step further and not just kind of be in the playoffs, but kind of pushing and having a look at the top two as well. Catherine, just finally, before we let you go, um, talk to us about 
uh, Leverkusen then tonight. Big game for West Ham and obviously a, a lot of City interest with, with Jared Bowen. And, you know, um, I saw him, I, I was at Wembley a couple of weeks ago for the Belgium game where he played and obviously scored the goal. He scored the goal right in front of us, which was ultimately disallowed. But he was, he was obviously Bellingham was, was, a, was, was incredible. But, you know, Jared was a delight to watch. What, what, what Talk to us about that. Well, unfortunately, Jared's not here in Leverkusen because he's um, out injured, which is going to oh, be a huge, yeah. a huge miss for David Moyes. And I think, obviously, you look at his—he's been brilliant this season. Um, you look at his form; he's 19 goals in all competitions, probably their Player of the Year. Very good mm. chance of getting that England squad if he—if uh, assuming this injury isn't too bad. Um, but yeah, he's going to be a big miss tonight, and they're missing a few other players West Ham as well. Um, the goalkeeper Al- Alphonse Areola is out. Um, Calvin Phillips is out, although based on current form, maybe that's not particularly a bad thing. Um, <laughs> and Edson Alvarez is suspended, and he's been, you know, when they've missed him in midfield, they've they've struggled at times. So it's going to be very difficult for them. Obviously, Leverkusen, forty-one games unbeaten this season, um, but it would be very West Ham to kind of be the first team to sort of surprisingly from nowhere beat them. And the thing about un- unbeaten runs is they've got to end at some point. So. Uh, maybe tonight is the night. A um, little bit of optimism there. But yeah, quite a lot of West Ham fans have made the journey over and um, hopefully they just take it back to, to London next week and they're still in the tie. Um, that's kind of, I think, the biggest thing for them tonight. Go on, Bernsley. Just on the subject of, just on the subject of Jared, Catherine, is, is he, is, what, what's the word on the street about? Is he likely to move? Is somebody likely to throw some money at West Ham in the, in the summer? Or where we well, he's it would take a lot of money, I think, because he, he signed a new contract um, earlier in the season. So he is, he is under contract. But we know kind of Liverpool have always liked him. And I think, you know, they'd be kind of the ones that would have a look at him um, if anyone was going to. And um, obviously with Jürgen Klopp leaving, I don't know kind of whether that affects it because he was kind of the person that was a really big admirer of him. Um, but I mean, you look at his goals, he's bound to kind of have clubs interested in him. West Ham will be desperate to keep him, obviously. Uh, it also might depend on kind of who's in charge of West Ham because I think, you know, Bowen has got quite a good relationship with David Moyes. Um, whether he's going to be here at the end of, you know, the start of next season feels kind of unlikely at the minute. So a lot will depend on that. Um, but yeah, as I say, he's, he's under contract. So West Ham will be, they'll be placing a pretty hefty uh, fee on his um, price tag on him, I think, if anybody was to try and have a go. And I must admit, I think the big factor for me, if I was Jared, I'd be scared to go and see my father-in-law to say <laughs> that uh, I, I want to leave your beloved West Ham, Danny. I, I, I'm, I'm going. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd risk that. And he seems to. He seems to fit the club. He's one of the main men. He's, you know, and, and I know he's 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 ambitious. I'm really pleased for him because I, I I thought he was fantastic at City, and um, I. I I, I think great credit to him for for what he's done and the way he's developed and making the England squad. He should be a shoe in for the Euros, shouldn't he's he? If, you know, as long as he stays injured, injury free. And yeah, and I, I, and I think you know it's it's it should be a great incentive for for all the young players at City to see the way you can develop. I, I know Steve Bruce brought him in from Hereford and everything like that, but um, yeah, I'm I'm just really pleased for him. Because I, I, it was a joy to watch him at City, I, I, and I don't think the you think of that team now with Jared Bowen in it that have made the Premier League this season, and maybe even with KLP. In fairness, yeah, and I'm pleased for him though he's not getting as many games at Brentford. But um, well, he's, anyway. he's been around. He's been he's been around recently, um, a bit more, hasn't he, over the last few weeks? Uh, Catherine, just for, very quickly, um. Big win for the Lionesses in, in Dublin the other night and, and great to see Leah, Will- Leah Williamson back after a torrid time with her ACL injury. Yeah, much needed win after the, the draw against Sweden, which was um, a little bit flat um, last week. And Republic of Ireland, very much an improving team, it was never going to be an easy game. Um, England got themselves in front, did their best to try and make it as difficult as it could be in the second half, um, kind of took their foot off the gas a little bit. And, um, you know, Ireland, if they'd taken a couple of their chances, could have made it very interesting. But the difference in the end was kind of the, you know, the clinical clinicalness of Lauren James and, and obviously Alex Green was scoring a penalty. So um, that's going to be a very tough group. But I think 
you know, they're going to have to get better before they play France in, in May because it's that'll be a step up in, in the level of opponent. Yeah, that, that, that one at Wembley looks like it being an absolute cracker, doesn't it? Um, yeah, well, I think well they, well, they play France at um, St James's Park actually um, in Newcastle, which uh, will be I think will be a really good game. Um, and then yeah, I mean, it's just kind of the group's just so tough. You kind of get like um, you've got France and Sweden and and England who are all in the top six ranked nations in in the world. Uh, and then you've got a very good improving team in the Republic of Ireland. So they actually play France back to back. They play them at home and then they play them away. And I think those two games will probably probably define kind of who finishes top. And then, you know, whoever kind of comes out, you know, it doesn't win, you know, those games will be fighting it out with Sweden for second place, probably. Brilliant. That's all we've got time for on the special bonus. Oh, Burns has got his finger in the air. Go on, that. Unless he needs a toilet. Just, just no, just to say, um, to plug, we've got the live event coming up. I think the details are out there now, aren't they, Bass? So we're going to do yeah. another 1904 Club live at the new Walton Street Club. Yeah, May the 7th, Tuesday, May the 7th. Um, we'll put it in the show notes uh, of, of how you can get tickets. Tickets will be going like they were before uh, when they went to the Tigers Trust. Proceeds will be going to charity. Um, guest list yet to be confirmed, um, but the tickets are on sale. As Bernsey says, New Walton Street Club, May the 7th. So it'll either be a couple of days after the final game at Plymouth or um, it will be a few days before a playoff semi-final. Let's hope it's the, the latter rather than the former. It's crossed. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. Good luck um, in Leverkusen tonight with the Hammers. Yes, thank you very much. And Burnsley, yes, thank you as always. And so we will be, we'll be back on Monday um, with the post-match show after what we hope will be a, a City victory. And you never know, Norwich could get beaten at Preston or draw, ideally, probably. Uh, and, and maybe that, that, that slither of hope remains going to Watford next Saturday. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening, everybody. Keep getting in touch with your tweets, your comments. Give us a like and whatever else. You can follow on YouTube as well. And we will be back again soon. Thank you very much for listening.